So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Oleg. I'm a quality assurance engineer at uh, JetBrains Rider, and uh, this is my first public speech. So I'm really glad and a little bit nervous to take a floor here, and I sincerely hope that you will enjoy this presentation. And uh, yeah, today is Friday the 13th, and I hope nothing goes wrong, and I won't be killed by Jason Voorhees or other bad guys during this talk, so something like that. And today I'm going to talk about uh, pretty scary things that also might seem to someone uh, specifically. I will talk about how to test uh, complex software systems. And in particular, I will uncover some insights on testing and real engine support in uh, JetBrains Rider. So first of all, some of you might not know what is JetBrains Rider. And let's just resolve this unfortunate oversight right now. Uh, well, Rider is an integrated uh, development environment for developing uh, .NET and Visual C++ applications, including some games on uh, Unity Engine and Unreal Engine. And uh, basically, my whole today's talk uh, will be about what's happening inside Rider. So let's move on and uh, define some uh, key points of this presentation. Uh, so today, I'm going to cover topic of uh, testing uh, really complex software, and uh, I will reveal some uh, internal and external dependencies of Rider, which make our product that complex. And then I will tell you about uh, problems one can meet uh, while testing such tool and uh, how these problems can basically be solved. And also I'll talk about how we manage uh, risks. And at last I will tell about automation in Rider. So uh, let's move on. And uh, I guess that some of you just heard that uh, this talk is about testing. And moreover, it's about testing uh, complex systems with an ID taken as main example and subject throughout the whole presentation. So probably some of you are listening to this speech and uh, having a fair enough question of how does this talk even relate to game development. And you know, I've got uh, several answers to this question. This talk is, uh, of course, not about uh, game development itself, but it's built around a tool uh, that helps to develop uh, some of our uh, favorite games, uh, you know. And uh, secondly, ID can be easily compared to uh, any tool that is used in game development. So, for instance, we can compare ID with uh, Scene Editor and uh, scene editor allows us to modify and beautify some objects that are placed on the scene. And uh, in IDEA, we can consider our code to be one of such objects, and we can also modify it and make it look better. And finally, if we compare uh, game development and ID development, uh, in both cases, you have a huge number of dependencies, and these facts should be always kept in mind. Uh, during the whole product's life cycle, uh, like when your product is in development, uh, when your product is in testing, and even when it's uh, in production. And uh, what dependencies here can mean uh, really a lot, like starting with some software dependencies and ending with uh, how some uh, events in game depend on each other and uh, what can happen to game if uh, these dependencies are broken. Uh, so now, since I mentioned something about dependencies, let's turn out to our uh, subject, I mean to our writer, and uh, let's take a look at uh, what's hiding inside it. So uh, here on this slide, I will show the structure of uh, writer and uh, of its uh, software dependencies. So uh, here, first of all, as you can see, uh, a lot of things are developed uh, in uh, writer itself only for writer. So it can be its own uh, like uh, product features that make uh, our product unique on the market. And also it can be some UI elements, icons, and so on. So it can be considered like a circular dependency on uh, itself. Uh, however, Rider is based on uh, IntelliJ IDEA that provides a general UI for all JetBrains IDEs and some core functionality like working with file system or rapid search of some ID features or classes or something else in your code. Uh, so like all this kind of stuff comes from IDEA. So we can unofficially call it as uh, Rider's uh, front end. 
Well, we talked about front-end, but uh, Rider's back-end, though, is uh, another JetBrains product. It's uh, ReSharper C++, and um, it is responsible for everything uh, related to C++ language support, like uh, quick fixes and actions, uh, Unreal Engine-specific language features, like auto-completion for your code with uh, smart include of files where some type is uh, declared and uh, also Unreal Engine code indexing for quick search of code, etc. So all such functionality comes to Rider from Rishapa C++ just for free. And uh, you won't believe uh, yet another uh, dependency of Rider is yet another JetBrains product. Uh, it's called CLion and uh, Rider inherits C++ debugger from it. And this debugger is based on uh, open source uh, LLDB, and it is developed and tuned mostly by uh, folks from c -Line team. But uh, in Rider, we manually test it and fix some issues that are directly related to debugging Unreal Engine projects or C++ projects by the forces only of Rider team. So we just don't ask folks from c -Line to fix our bugs. And it's worth mentioning here that uh, debugger behavior is uh, really different on uh, different operating systems. And uh, I don't know how to just to provide some example over here. Like uh, for data visualization, uh, for example, and uh, evaluation of expressions. And uh, basically, this fact slowly, slowly brings us to uh, our next dependency. Uh, it is uh, Unreal Engine itself. Well, you know, because uh, we are providing advanced support for working with Unreal Engine projects, we need to be always kept up to date uh, on what's happening uh, in Unreal Engine. And uh, we have to support uh, some new features that are provided by Unreal. And uh, we need to... Uh, track all the changes that are made on time and uh, deliver our product with uh, minimal quality risks. So we just must be sure that Rider will properly work uh, with uh, the new release version of Unreal Engine. So also I'll provide some uh, examples of functionality from Unreal Engine where we have to track changes. Uh, first of all, we need to check if there are some changes in format of data visualization uh, and storage like uh, objects in debugger, for example, and uh, format of uh, game assets uh, like blueprints and so on. So uh, Rider could provide uh, some advanced functionality related to working with um, blueprints. Uh, also, loading project in Rider uh, directly depends on internal uh, Unreal Engine tool that is called Unreal Build Tool that is also responsible for almost everything related to uh, project files and compiling the project. So just project loading speed depends on how fast um, Unreal Build Tool generates uh, project files and uh, how fast Rider passes them. And also changes made in Unreal Engine might affect uh, functionality that is provided by plugins developed by JetBrains. And here I would like to make a lyrical digression and uh, tell you some details about plugins that allow to have advanced Unreal Engine integration with Rider. So uh, you can see Rider on this slide. And it has uh, two plugins for Unreal Editor. Uh, they are called Unreal Link and EasyArcs. And uh, Unreal Editor also has two plugins for uh, more advanced integration with Rider. And these plugins are called uh, Rider Link and Rider Source Code Access. So let's look at uh, all these plugins. And I will tell a few things about uh, each, of each plugin and show some real issues that were caused by them. So uh, let's start from uh, EasyArcs plugin because you know it kind of corresponds to its uh, name and it's uh, really easy to understand. Like all that it does, it adds a UI element, uh, a combo box uh, on a toolbar. Uh, and when you launch your Unreal Engine project, uh, you can pass uh, some additional arguments to command line and these arguments will be applied. So like, you see, everything is really quite simple. And you will definitely ask, uh, how can such small innocent plugin cause any bug or break something in the product? And uh, here is a real example of the bug. Like you see, EasyArcs freezes Rider completely, uh, starting from uh, some versions. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the reason why it's happened. Uh, 
because plugin adds a UI component, it interacts with uh, ID front end and uh, all the UI components in ID should be loaded sequentially on uh, IDE startup. Uh, so UI component that was provided by EasyArcs uh, wasn't loaded on its time, and that caused uh, such behavior like ID is unusable when this plugin is turned on. Uh, so the second plugin in our list uh, is uh, Rider Source Code Access plugin, and uh, this plugin is bundled into Unreal Engine distributions, and this plugin allows uh, users to select Rider as an uh, editor for source code. So it finds all the versions of Rider installed on the machine and it lists them. So user can choose uh, any version that they want. And after version is chosen, any action in a real editor that is related to code uh, will open uh, Rider and focus uh, its editor on a concrete place in the code, like on the declaration of class or some method and so on. So that's basically how the plugin works. Uh, and regarding which bugs uh, it can cause, uh, I think some of you might all already have uh, some suggestions, so you can just check yourself now. Uh, like the most common problem uh, is that uh, Rider Source Code Access plugin in some cases cannot find some uh, Rider instances that are installed on the machine. And uh, here is uh, an issue, and uh, you can see an issue summary that uh, there we have uh, some uh, toolbox mentioned. And actually, uh, toolbox is uh, one more dependency of Rider that appeared due to Rider Source Code Access plugin. Uh, just a quick remark, uh, JetBrains Toolbox is a tool that is uh, developed by JetBrains, and it allows to manage uh, installations of all the other JetBrains products. So. Uh, in the issue description, we can see that um, uh, instances uh, of Rider stopped being found by uh, Rider's source code access plugin uh, after Toolbox was updated to version 2.0. So uh, this was a brand new version of uh, JetBrains Toolbox, and we, it was in uh, closed preview only. So we needed to test how our plugin works uh, after update, and uh, this bug just uh, revealed itself. So. Uh, now we have a uh, new uh, look of uh, our dependencies diagram, and here we have uh, JetBrains Toolbox app added, and you know, this look even isn't final. It's just transitional, and we're still not done yet, uh, because uh, we have uh, two last plugins, uh, Unreal Link and uh, Rider Link. Uh, these plugins are coming together because Unreal Link is kind of playing role of uh, front-end or client if you want, and uh, Rider Link plugin is playing uh, back-end or uh, server role. Uh, so here on the screenshot, uh, you see Rider, and there are several zones uh, highlighted. Uh, so you see some um, uh, play buttons on toolbar, um, you see some panel with logs and counter of usages of uh, some C++ class inside Unreal Engine assets. And uh, these are features of uh, Unreal Link plugin that allow to interact with uh, Unreal Editor without leaving Rider. So you can start, pause, and uh, stop your game. So like checking logs uh, for what's happening when your game is running and uh, jump directly to uh, some assets inside Unreal Editor. Uh, without leaving Rider. Uh, so, yes. Um, you can jump directly to these assets and uh, see uh, what's uh, going on uh, inside them. Uh, and these assets are basically inherited from uh, the C++ class. And on the slide, there's uh, one thing left uh, on the left side on the screenshot. Uh, you see some... Uh, C++ projects uh, in project tree. And uh, this is basically backend part of uh, Unreal Link plugin, and it is called uh, Rider Link. So uh, Rider Link plugin contains uh, C++ code, so uh, all, all earlier mentioned functionality could actually work. So without Rider Link plugin uh, installed inside your project, we, we will be able only to see all these buttons and panels, but actually not to use them. Uh, you can extract uh, Rider Link into your Unreal Engine project, and after it's started, it's required to compile it before it actually starts working. And this is the most problematic place with uh, this plugin. 
we have uh, tons of requests that rider link uh, cannot be compiled uh, due to some uh, reasons and here's one of such issues that was uh, reported to us uh, like rider link cannot be compiled after updating visual studio to the latest release uh, how's Visual Studio related to Rider? Uh, well, Unreal Engine is uh, working only with MSVC toolchain that is provided by Visual Studio. And it means that uh, Rider uh, uses all uh, the Visual Studio tools like compiler, uh, linker, and so on to be able to build uh, Unreal Engine projects. And the same situation is on macOS, where uh, toolchain for C++ is taken from Xcode. So Rider as well cannot build Unreal Engine projects without Xcode installed on the machine. And so this fact gives us uh, two more dependencies, Visual Studio and Xcode. Uh, so this basically is our final form of uh, Rider's dependencies uh, diagram. And look how ginormous and massive it is. It looks really impressive, isn't it? Like. I personally like it and love it. Yeah, but actually not. <laughs> so yes, it's terrible. And I guess all of you understood uh, that uh, such number of dependencies and such uh, deep level of uh, integration, uh, of course, bring some problems to us. So let's take a look at them and see if they can be solved. Uh, well, so the first problem is that uh, you see some angry user came and uh, blamed Rider that it broke everything uh, again. So it's like not the first situation when uh, something similar occurs. And uh, the problem actually here is that uh, users will always blame your product first and they don't care if a problem is caused by some uh, other program that is included into product they use or not, so they just will come to your bug tracker and next morning after your product's release, you'll just open your eyes, stretch yourself, pour yourself some coffee, open your laptop and see such requests like, like directly pointing that uh, this was your project that uh, broke everything. So users will be like, hello, how are you? We are under the water, literally sinking without ability to work. And of course, such issues uh, usually cause uh, much stress for people involved into product development, support engineers, developers, quality assurance engineers, uh, like whoever. And these people usually have uh, really little time to make a proper fix, test it and cover all the scenarios that might have been affected by the fix. And uh, also these people uh, need to roll out uh, the hotfix version as soon as possible. And the question that appears here is uh, how to prevent uh, such situations and uh, minimize risks. And thanks God, there is a solution. And this solution is uh, to use uh, for testing some uh, preview versions of tools that your product depends on. And this uh, solution is a lifesaver here. Uh, because in this case, you will be aware of uh, changes in new versions. You can notify your team about uh, these changes, and then you can just make sure that your product works properly with uh, these versions of external tools. So it's like a win-win for everyone, uh, like for people who develop the product, for people who test it, for its users, and for everyone. Uh, okay, so let's slightly move to the second problem that is caused by such a huge number of software dependencies. Uh, so I guess you remember how uh, Rider's dependencies diagram look uh, like, uh, and uh, it becomes quite clear that uh, only manual testing of uh, such product is definitely a bad decision. So you will get mad immediately. Like uh, you will lose some important changes. You'll forget about uh, some required checks that must uh, be done before the release. You'll spend a lot of time uh, doing the same checks for every single Unreal Engine version in the existence. So, like all these emissions are unfortunately inherent to manual testing and uh, cost of a mistake is really big, not only for testers, but again, for everyone, especially for users. And here, our undebatable helper for minimizing risks that are brought by manual testing is automation. Yeah, look how happy I am. <laughs> so, 
uh, let's take a deeper look at uh, how automation in uh, Rider basically works and how we automate things in Rider. And here I need to make uh, yet another lyrical digression here. Uh, just a little rewind into the history of Rider. Uh, so in the very beginning, uh, Rider was uh, planned as an IDE for .NET. So its development, uh, including the uh, development of uh, test uh, test framework, uh, was um, carried out, uh, having in mind only .NET projects. Uh, so tests were written for .NET as well, only for .NET. And only after uh, some time from the first release, uh, idea for supporting Visual C++ and particularly Unreal Engine appeared. And uh, when necessity of tests for C++ uh, and Unreal Engine projects became obvious, it just turned out that we have some problems in existing test framework. And that's why I split it into .NET projects and Unreal Engine projects. Uh, so let's uh, take a deeper look at it and uh, try to understand what's the difference between uh, writing tests for .NET and for Unreal Engine. Uh, so uh, first of all, .NET development is associated uh, mostly with uh, C Sharp language, which is quite a little bit different from C++. Uh, .NET projects are loaded in other way than C++. So uh, during the first attempt to run tests for uh, C++ projects using existing test framework, it turned out that uh, projects loading uh, couldn't be validated at all. So it was needed to make some changes in the test framework in order to make it work. Uh, the other problem that was met it uh, that we can uh, we cannot reuse. Uh, already existing API for testing C++ projects since uh, some systems uh, for .NET and for C++ are implemented in uh, different ways. So here I can think of an example. It will be about uh, debugger in .NET that was uh, written uh, and implemented by a writer team from scratch, uh, whereas uh, C++ debugger was uh, developed by another team. Uh, and they took existing open source LLDB debugger, uh, they tuned it and integrated it firstly into Lion and then into Rider. So due to this fact, uh, API that is used for writing .NET debugger tests cannot be used for writing C++ debugger tests. So test framework in uh, Rider was again in a strong need of new APIs that uh, would allow to automate uh, testing for C++ in Rider. Um, well, the next thing uh, that uh, makes a difference between uh, tests uh, between uh, .NET uh, projects and uh, Unreal Engine projects is that uh, .NET tests are setting up uh, environment uh, on the fly, whereas Unreal Engine tests uh, need uh, pre-installed uh, environment and some separate uh, machines where these tests can be run. Uh, and it is caused by the fact that uh, Unreal Engine itself is uh, huge and massive and setting it up with uh, every single test run is absolutely useless and has literally no sense. Uh, therefore, Unreal Engine tests should be run on uh, some special testing machines uh, which have a special setup of tool chains, uh, concrete versions of Unreal Engine installed and configured, while uh, .NET tests can be run on any machine since .NET SDK, uh, SDK is uh, downloaded and installed uh, within the tests. And, you know, to be honest, there are many, many more reasons uh, why there is such a difference in .NET and Unreal Engine tests. But if I kept talking about them, uh, it would be taken for at least two years. <laughs> and I don't think anybody is actually interested in it. But now you are partially aware of uh, our way of the samurai. So that's great. Uh, let's move on and uh, take a look um, on... Uh, the algorithm of uh, running Unreal Engine tests. Uh, well, firstly, we actually need to start our test. And uh, so when we started, 
uh, we then uh, almost immediately start uh, to uh, look for all the Unreal Engine versions installed in the machine. And uh, then we are filtering them uh, so to pick only those versions that we want to test. And after that, we sequentially set uh, Unreal Engine version to the corresponding new project file. And uh, by uh, meaning your project file here, uh, uh, so your project is an Unreal Engine uh, project descriptor. And uh, then we have a condition on uh, how we basically load the project. Uh, so if test is opening and loading project as a Visual C++ solution, uh, then we need to call a special uh, Unreal Build Tool command uh, that will uh, generate Visual C++ project files that a uh, writer can open. And if test is opening and loading project uh, directly via uh, your project file, uh, we just uh, run tests since in this case project files are generated on the stage of uh, project loading and there is no need to explicitly call some other comments in order to generate uh, project files. It's done automatically within the tests. So as you can see, uh, after Visual C++ project files are generated, we run tests as well. So there's only one extra action uh, if test is opening uh, project as a Visual C++ solution. And uh, after that, when we're having our tests uh, running, we are doing some uh, test magic and test either passes or fails. And then it is uh, cleaning all the leftover data and uh, it is getting ready for the next run. So here's uh, such a diagram uh, of how do we run tests. And uh, uh, this approach of uh, running tests can be called as uh, write one, get x free. And I will explain why. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, the following table. Uh, so here columns are the ways of opening Unreal Engine projects. And uh, um, uh, rows here are versions of Unreal Engine that we use uh, in order to open uh, test projects and uh, run tests against them. Uh, each test equals to some scenario that we check. And this test uh, multiplies uh, on number of uh, ways of uh, project opening and on number of uh, versions of uh, Unreal Engine that we use for running tests. Uh, so currently we have only two project uh, models, like ways of loading project. It's a Visual C++ solution and a native Unreal Engine, so-called uh, new project model. But if we suddenly decide to support or invent some new way to open Unreal Engine projects, who knows, we could uh, write tests for this new way of project loading with uh, minimal efforts, and uh, these tests will work as well. And as you can see, usually we take four mentioned here versions uh, like uh, latest Unreal Engine 4, pre-latest Unreal Engine 5, latest Unreal Engine 5, and Unreal Engine 5 taken from GitHub. And there we are testing uh, branch uh, UE5-main uh, uh, because we are using uh, preview versions for testing. I guess you remember it. And uh, also you can see that... Uh, there are also three dots, uh, both for project models and for Unreal Engine versions. Here, I just wanted to show that uh, independently from how many project models we could have and how many versions of Unreal Engine we could use, uh, tests will still work. So that's why I basically named this slide as write one, get X free, uh, because there is no fixed number of uh, test runs. It depends only on the environment where tests are running and uh, by filters that are set by the test itself. Okay, so uh, let's move on. On the previous slide, I mentioned uh, that mostly in test runs, we take uh, three versions of uh, Unreal Engine from uh, Epic Games Store, and these versions are pre-built. So you install the distributions with uh, already built and working binaries, and there is no need to compile uh, the whole Unreal Engine by yourself. Uh, but also in tests, uh, we use a version that is built from source, and I would like to tell about uh, the differences between how tests are running against versions uh, that are taken from Epic Games Store and against uh, GitHub version. 
So, uh, first of all, we have uh, different constraints on uh, uh, how do we basically load a project that targets either a version of Unreal Engine that is taken from Epic Games Store or which is taken from uh, GitHub. Uh, and that's happening so because uh, in this case, number of loaded projects um, on project opening is uh, significantly bigger than number of uh, loaded projects when opening Unreal Engine project that targets Epic Games Store uh, version of Engine. Uh, so we are reducing a uh, number of projects to be loaded, abandoning from loading uh, like uh, all the projects that provide some extra functionality, which isn't required for test running. Uh, so the second thing is that uh, when we compare uh, Epic Games Store and GitHub uh, engine distributions, it turns out that uh, many things are located in uh, different places and work slightly different as well. So here is an example uh, of what we should call in order to generate project files for the C++ part of your Unreal Engine project. Uh, in case of uh, engine is taken from Epic Games Store, we need to call uh, Unreal Build Tool directly. So you see Unreal Build Tool .dll, uh, over here in the first line. And um, if uh, engine is taken from uh, GitHub, we need to call a special script that uh, first we will check that everything is ready for generating project files. Then, if it is uh, needed, the script uh, will build all auxiliary programs that are required for. Uh, performing uh, generation of project files, and only then it will actually generate uh, project files. And, uh, you know, there are many other cases which uh, brings us uh, a lot of conditions, both in the product and in tests, like if engine is built from source or is taken from GitHub, then uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, you can see lots of this in the code. Uh, and one more thing that uh, worth mentioning here is that uh, not only tests uh, for um, engine versions taken from Epic Games Store and uh, GitHub distributions are different, but also many things have uh, changed uh, with uh, the first uh, release version of Unreal Engine 5. Uh, so, for instance, uh, our good old friend Unreal Build Tool was uh, rewritten from uh, .NET Framework to uh, .NET Core, and its extension changed from uh, .exe to .dll. So again, we should write some very interesting constructions, like if Unreal Engine version is 5.0 or later, then blah, 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 else blah, blah, blah. And again, it can be seen all over the code base, in uh, product itself, in tests, wherever. So, uh, of course, uh, manual testing and uh, automation uh, complement each other because uh, some bugs caught by uh, manual case are provided to automators then. And uh, manual case can provide uh, more context for automation team about how things do actually work depending on the concrete cases and conditions. And automators in their turn uh, won uh, manual QAs about uh, tests uh, that failed and ask them to recheck the scenario that failed in the product itself. Uh, and uh, it's worth mentioning here that in our case, uh, because we have a lot of uh, software dependencies, we can uh, let people from other teams, like from C Line, from Reshape C, from IntelliJ IDEA, uh, we can let them know that uh, some scenario might be broken in their tool as well. So, you know, like friendship and happiness is everywhere. We are helping each other and it basically works great so far. Uh, okay, so uh, let's take a look at the test data, uh, I think. And uh, I will show that... Uh, uh, it's very important to choose the uh, data for your tests because uh, you need uh, to have some granularity of tests and you need to cover all the basic scenarios. So uh, we are using an uh, empty Unreal Engine project, uh, which is uh, created from a template that is provided by Epic Games. And uh, such choice of uh, test data allows us to quickly and automatically check some uh, very basic scenarios. 
And uh, despite the fact that Unreal Engine itself is uh, huge and massive, you remember, loading speed of uh, empty project is uh, really fast. And this is ideal for test running. So many OKs could have a little break and then investigate some more serious scenarios uh, on bigger projects that are closer to real ones. And uh, another important point uh, is that we use four different engine versions for automation, and this helps to keep uh, backward compatibility. Uh, so uh, we um, are making sure that uh, all uh, our changes to support uh, newest versions of Unreal Engine don't break support of uh, older Unreal Engine versions. And as I've already mentioned here, uh, we also use Unreal Engine from GitHub. You see it's highlighted with red on the second screenshot. Uh, so we use it in our auto tests. And the fact uh, that we are using a uh, main branch there also allows us to make sure that when a new Unreal Engine version is released, um, Rider will probably properly support it because uh, all the basic scenarios are covered by our auto tests. And therefore, we have guarantees for uh, old versions of Unreal Engine, actual versions, and not released yet versions. Such choice of test data gives us like uh, full protection. And also, it's worth uh, mentioning that uh, test framework was uh, significantly improved and enhanced uh, in the last couple months. And uh, this fact gave us an opportunity to make uh, our auto tests being run on uh, larger projects that are closer to real ones. Like for instance, uh, we can uh, run our tests on a uh, Lyra Starter game sample that is provided by uh, Epic Games to learn features of Unreal Engine 5. And if it happens so, you know, after such product is added to auto tests, like manual case could just have a break and chill. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 sorry. I mean, I mean, they could investigate some more serious scenarios and they could have even more time to just test some new cool features of the product without rechecking the same scenario for eight possible configurations uh, for 50 times a day. And that's cool. So kudos here to automation. And uh, I would like to sum up my big talk um, and I would like to say that uh, all the solutions and tricks uh, I told about here aren't our uh, own inventions. Uh, we just try to apply some uh, facts from uh, testing theory to our reality and you know it works pretty well to be honest. And of course we haven't reached uh, good results at once. Uh, we had a lot of bugs, we had plenty hot fixes, like we had angry users coming and saying that our product bake uh, their daily routine workflow. And uh, you know, after having all these problems, you were just looking at this and uh, almost immediately you started feeling yourself like this frog from my show. And uh, um, you know, every such negative situation, though, gave its uh, positive fruits. And now, by uh, trial and error, we know that we are on the right way with our testing. And we finally have an uh, understanding of uh, that we are doing everything correct. Uh, so I, want to uh, I have to mention there that uh, Testing theory is uh, usually invented by some very smart people who have some understanding about how things work. So just uh, theory is also your good friend over here. Uh, so also, even if your product has a lot of software dependencies, just uh, don't be afraid. It can be tested well without uh, spending uh, your whole life for it. Just communicate with your teammates and people from other teams get some help uh, use preview versions of uh, your external tools that your product is uh, bound to and remember that almost everything can be automated just uh, give it a try and again request help if you feel that you need help and automation is also is uh, your good friend over here don't cancel or abandon it especially if tool that you test is uh, too complicated. 
And also the last thing uh, that I wanted to do here is to thank uh, my colleagues who helped me to not go nuts uh, throughout my everyday working life. And in particular with uh, preparing this talk uh, and um, uh, making it actually happen here. So kudos here to Tatiana Karolova, uh, who provided me with the idea to prepare a talk for this conference. Also to Andrea Kinchin, who helped me a lot with uh, these slides. Also for Anastasia Kazakova and Alexander Pirogov uh, for being my helping hands with any questions. And my breath uh, teammates, Artem Chuguev and Maxim Golobtsov uh, for their support and sharing some sacred uh, details about uh, how our automation works. And just look how suspiciously these guys stare at you. Like if you don't automation, if you don't automate your tests, they will find you. So just handle your business correctly. So uh, that is all, folks. Thank you very much for uh, your attention, for attending my talk. And I hope you found this presentation interesting, or at least you've learned something interesting and new from it. Cheers. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I've learned that um, I need to automate my tests or these scary people are going <laughs> to get me. This is a very important takeaway from this talk, I think. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And you had some nice pictures of us. Thank you. That was fun. Hopefully, like Alex is also having fun there on Cyprus with his fantastic pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, before we proceed with the questions, I will just uh, give you some small break to brief after this fantastic talk. And um, so Thank yeah, you. and because I saw some discussions in the chat, so I'll try to explain the thing which I used to explain many, many times already, but I think that's still worth explaining because it's important. So in JetBrains, we have several tools covering um, sometimes the same languages and technologies, and sometimes the people are confused, which is a proper one. So uh, if you're doing a game development um, and would like to take a JetBrains tool uh, for a run, so Rider is a proper choice here. So Rider supports um, Unity and also Unreal Engine. And um, there is Godot support. There is a special plugin for that. So uh, if you take any of these or if you do any like custom C++ engine, uh, Rider is also good for that. Um, like we also have another product which was mentioned in this talk, which is C-Line, which is a general purpose C++ ID. It doesn't have the Unreal Engine support. And the like quite popular question here is like, why actually? Um, and the reason is very simple because we think that the uh, we should not like just divide tools by languages, but we should divide the tools by the like use cases in the environments that people are using. And the Rider is just a better fit for game developers because it's already Already has this uh, like when we were adding the C++ support, it already had this um, Unity support, Kadat, so it was like uh, perfectly tuned for that, and also it actually works uh, with all this Microsoft environment thingy. And I guess like game development is still a lot about Windows, right? So um, it's like focused on that a lot. But if you do any other general purpose C++ development, C line um, should be good for you. So yeah, I hopefully I kind of answered that uh, typical uh, thingy uh, often asked during our like game dev streams or uh, under the game dev talks. And we can um, get to questions with that. Um, so like, first of all, uh, maybe I can just ask a look here. You have like this amazing shim and that many things here. How long does it take you to do like, you know, <laughs> like a general check before you say, yeah, guys, this build is fine. You can go with it to a production and deploy to these amazing people in the chat who will be using it then. Uh, well, yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, because I'm not working alone, I have my teammates. It uh, just takes uh much uh, more little time than it uh, should uh, than it would take if I uh, was working on my own. Uh, so yeah, I guess that it's taking about uh, two whole days of uh, continuous testing. Uh, like you're sitting and rechecking some scenarios, then you're waiting for auto tests to pass, uh, which also takes uh, some time because there might be some problems on uh, CI CD tools or uh, something in the code that might uh, have been broken. And you know, yeah, I guess uh, two days would be enough just to split, uh, require some checks between uh, two people. So that's okay, I guess. 
Yeah. And I take it that that's a lot of scenarios being tested there as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you know, you trade. <laughs> so you uh, know your business correctly and just domain uh, testing, you know. <laughs> well, if we're having a couple of glitches there with the stream there. Could you repeat that last little bit, please? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me well? Uh, hopefully, yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, uh, you're kind of getting used to uh, all the uh, scenarios. So it's like automation uh, testing when you are doing it manually. Like you are going there, you are pressing this button, you check that everything is correct. And, you know, it's like uh, really, really fast. So if you're doing for the first time, it's complicated, but then you are getting used to it. So it's kind of easy and simple. 